Good evening and welcome to our very special program tonight. My name is Susan Engel and I have the privilege of being the director of the lecture series here at 92nd Street Y. Tonight is a very exciting night for all of us and I am very pleased to announce the launch of this new series at 92nd Street Y in partnership with Mount Sinai Hospital called Relevant Octogenarians. We will be continuing this series on December 10th with a panel of celebrated entertainers who are living proof that just as our guests who you will soon meet, that there are many things that do get better with age. I invite you to go to our website, www.92y.org, for more information on this and all our programs. Before I welcome to the stage our producer for tonight, allow me to cover just a few pieces of house business. We have a very full panel of luminaries with us. And if we would take the time to introduce each one, we would be here all night. We just uh, counted up the years between all of the guests on our stage, and we figure it's above 500 years. <laughs> so in the interest of time, I invite you to look at the program you have been given for a full outline of each guest's extraordinary accomplishments. Second, we encourage your participation, and the ushers have handed out index cards for you to ask your questions. They will come down the aisle to collect once midway through our program. Finally, I welcome you to join us afterwards in our adjacent art gallery, where one of our guests, Paul Volker, has graciously agreed to sign copies of a recent biography about him. Now for the truly visionary man who is made tonight possible. In addition to his many attributes as a lawyer and businessman, his passion has been the service he has done to our community at the 92nd Street Y, having been a board member, the longest serving board member in our board, on our board for over 50 years. Truly, no one represents so well the values of 92nd Street Y with his profound sense of humanity and consistency in his commitment to what matters most in life. He's a wonderful husband to his beautiful wife, Renee, who is with us in the audience, and a fantastic father and grandfather, and a consummate professional. It is his caring and dedication that has put this important issue of our time on the map for not only us at 92nd Street Y, but now all over the world through the broadcast of this program to our satellite locations as well as online. I've known Dan for most of the 30 years that I've worked at the 92nd Street Y, and I can tell you that he is someone who leads by example and is truly the most relevant octogenarian I know. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Dan Kaplan. I'm in big trouble at home. <laughs> Renee, I apologize. <laughs> thank you very, very much, Susan, and thank you for coming. I didn't think in 1965, when I first joined the board of the 92nd Street Y, that I would have the unique privilege of standing before you and introducing a new series called Relevant Octogenarians. A very special thanks to our executive director, Saul Adler, and Henry Timms for your, for your absolute faith in us octos. 
Tonight's program is co-sponsored by Mount Sinai Hospital. The 92nd Street Y and Mount Sinai are sharing a very special month, September. It's called Health and Wellness Month, and under which these two great institutions have joined together to offer special programs, events, lectures to help the community improve and learn about how to live a healthy life. Now, you may wonder why tonight the lecture is starting at 7.30. Keep in mind, this is an early bird special. <laughs> why are we doing a relevant octogenarian series? Today, there are approximately 78 million baby boomers. How many of you in this audience were born after 1946 and before 1964? If you are, not many, <laughs> if you are, you fit the definition of a baby boomer. The first of your generation of baby boomers reached age 65 in 2011. Your life expectancy is increasing every year, and retirement ages are going younger and younger and younger. Many of the boomer generation will face 25 years after mandatory retirement and before their mortality. It is my hope and dream that this great institution, which I have been involved with so long, will enable the enormous population of baby boomers to enjoy a meaningful later life, as have all of the people on this panel. And I thank the panelists for their willingness and commitment to share the, the, gener the genius of their graceful and successful aging. My wife and I are very privileged that many of our dearest and closest friends have come from Westchester and afar to share this evening. Thank you to Mary Ann and Stanley Snyder. Mary Ann is turning 80 tomorrow, and she brought, she brought a whole gang of her New York friends. She's from Boston, and so is Stanley. They brought a very large number of their New York-based friends to join us tonight as a way to celebrate her 80th birthday. If you are planning a memorable event, why not come to the Y? It is now my great privilege and, and, and pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Deborah Marin, appropriately a geriatric psychiatrist at Mount Sinai, without whose help and guidance tonight would not have been possible. Deborah, Dr. Marin, come on out. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm just going to bore you with a few comments of mine. So uh, one definition of aging is that it's a decline at a tissue, organ, or uh, other biological levels. But we have to remember that aging is not necessarily an illness. And aging the, is a process that's very complex and is really relies upon the interdependent factors, which include the biology, psychology, economic and social factors in one's life, which I think will be very interesting to hear from our panel. We all know we're an aging population, and individuals who are 85 and older are the fastest growing sector of our population. Currently, this group includes 4 million individuals, and by 2050, there will be over 9 million. Let's look at centenarians. In 1950, there were 3,000 centenarians in the U.S. Census. By 2050, there will be over a million. During the course of the 20th century, life expectancy had skyrocketed from about 49 years in 1901 to 77 years in 2000, and we continue to grow older. By 2030, when the last baby boomer will have reached 65, the number of individuals 65 and older will have doubled since 2000 and women's and men's life expectancy will have increased to 87 and 86 years, respectively. So just a few comments about how medical advances have actually improved how we live and how long we live. Let's take cardiac illness as an example. 
Starting about 30 years ago with the introduction of intensive care units and better other um, interventions for folks who've had heart attacks, the mortality and morbidity from that illness decreased substantially. In addition, the introduction of statins, like Lipitor, has both improved prevention of it and also outcomes of folks who may have cardiac conditions, including stroke. And the past decade alone, improvements in medical technology has been very important. For example, the introduction of the drug-eluting stent in 2003, and now minimal invasive surgery for coronary bypass surgery, which can be done through an artery in the leg, have also improved outcomes. Now, genes play a role in aging, and there are over 100 genes that are involved in longevity. And genes account for 24 to 40 percent of the aging process. And there are some good genes that are called actually longevity genes that have very different, very different functions on how the body deals with stress and uh, regulation of cell growth, for example, not having cancer growth. And studies of centenarians provide very interesting information. Relatives of centenarians, children, are less likely to get medical illness. If you're a sibling of a centenarian, you're at least four times as likely to be a centenarian yourself. And brothers do the best. So what other factors are important for successful aging? Scientists look at the importance of maintaining physical function, avoiding or managing medical illness very well, the psychological aspect of aging, being resilient, being hardy, being able to savor the moment. Social issues are very important, both participating in activities like this and having social networks that are meaningful to you, and also living in an environment that's healthy for your lifestyle. Speaking of lifestyle, it's very important to have a normal weight, a healthy diet, exercise, particularly aerobic and others. Maintaining also ability to have some stress reduction, for example, yoga, tai chi have been shown to be helpful. And interventions regarding this beginning in your 60s can help you. It's not too late to start. Okay. I'd like to talk about Mount Sinai, my alma mater. I've been there for many years. Um, Mount Sinai is rated 14th in the country as best hospitals. And that's really quite remarkable for a few reasons. One is we do serve a very varied population, some of whom do not have the ability or social support to necessarily gain the best access to care, yet we try very hard to provide that. And we're not a university. We don't have an endowment that the universities have. We are kind of like a biomedical college. In fact, Mount Sinai is number third in NIH funding for, mon for money per researcher. Areas of research and departments that look at aging include geriatrics, cardiac illness, brain disease, orthopedics, and genetics. Genetics is particularly interesting because of the 25,000 genes that have been found in the gene code, genome code, only a few have been shown to necessarily affect illness in one specific way, meaning only one gene accounts for a small variance of the development of an illness. Rather, it's the interplay of these genes, which can only be understood by very substantial mathematical model and, and supercomputers, where we better have a handle on this. And this research is being done at Sinai. I want to thank you all for coming. I can't wait to hear what our panel has to say. I'd like to introduce Mr. Lopate. And um, what an extraordinary panel Dan Kaplan has put together. George Mitchell, um, <laughs> Peter Peterson, Muriel Siebert, Ed Koch, Paul Volcker. Uh, until I, uh, I left graduate school, I thought I was going to be a fine artist, and then reality intruded, and I've had a number of different careers since uh, my late 20s. Paul, you got an MA in political economy from Harvard and then attended the London School of Economics. So you must have known what you wanted to do fairly early in your life. No, absolutely a straight line. Oh, he's, he's reading my, my notes. <laughs> I said, I said uh, was it a straight line to be named <laughs> chairman of the Federal Reserve? I'm not going to let you even. <laughs> But was it a straight line? I mean, no, did, do I, you see, did, did your career uh, just continue because no, 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 of? No, no, I can remember I was a young man, and I was in banking. I was in the Federal Reserve early on. I was in banks, too. And I thought, you know, someday 
might be nice to be a member of the Board of Governors. I but but you, didn't, you didn't have any, uh, any detours. No. Some of these people well, had incredible detours in their lives. Well, I had minor detours. <laughs> I, a well-paved road, but minor details. Muriel, in your case, uh, can I call you Mickey, by the way? Sure. Um, didn't you begin your career working at various brokerages? So was Wall Street the only place you ever wanted to work? Well, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, and my sister lived in New York, and I had a place to sleep, which was her couch. And I came here with a used Studebaker, and I got a job as a trainee in research at Beijing Company. You came in the Studebaker, so you didn't know whether you were coming or going, right? <laughs> well, the car told me. <laughs> uh, wasn't the big challenge for you getting a seat on the New York Stock Exchange? Yes, the idea came from a client because I was tired of switching jobs. I was being paid 25 to 50% less than the men were making. And I asked Gerald Tsai, the Chinese money manager, I said, Jerry, what large firm can I go to where I'll be paid equally? And Jerry Tsai looked at me and he said, don't be ridiculous, you won't. Buy a seat, work for yourself. And I took the Constitution home of the New York Stock Exchange and I studied it. And I said, I can pass that. That's great, except that you had to get uh, people to support you and that wasn't so easy. It was, no, it was, it was not. really an all boys club. Well, the thing that was the worst for me, and I was lucky, I did overcome it. Ed, in your case, uh, had you always wanted to go into politics? Didn't you want to play baseball when you were a kid? No. Oh. <laughs> your brother? No, I, um, my, That's my what brother. Dan told. Dan my, told me you wanted to play baseball, so he's. My, uh, my brother was the athlete in our uh, family. He was very, very good. I was terrible. I had no coordination. In fact, uh, when they had pickup teams, uh, my brother, who was a wonderful brother, now deceased, would say, if you want me, you got to take Ed. <laughs> 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 and that went on for about two weeks, and then he said to me, my brother, you're no good. <laughs> I said, but Harold, I want to play. He said, find something that you do well. I said, what do I do well, Harold? He said, you talk good. <laughs> yeah. And that's how I became a lawyer. Oh, okay. <laughs> So, and then that led to politics, and then that led to being a TV judge, a radio talk show host, a film reviewer. Right. Have I left anything out? Well, uh, I have a television show and a radio show, and the thing that I enjoy the most are the commentaries that I write every week, and if at the end of the program you want to get them and they are free, just give me your email and you'll <laughs> get them uh, next tomorrow. Pete, didn't you drop out of MIT? Had you been, been interested in science and technology at first? Drop out is a euphemism. I got thrown out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was the luckiest uh, thrown out ever, wasn't it? So well, um, I, I remember taking a course in descriptive geometry, and I am totally devoid of any visual abilities. And the professor at the end of the class asked me if I could visit with him privately. And he said, Mr. Peterson, I've been teaching here 27 years. You have done something really um, remarkable. This is the lowest score in the history of 27 years. <laughs> now, whatever led you to think you belonged at MIT? And I said, I'll be damned if I know. <laughs> But that wasn't so bad. You, your career has taken you all over the place. Market research, advertising. You were a, worked for a movie equipment maker. You were Nixon's assistant to the president for international economic affairs, and then his secretary of commerce. You've been an investment banker. That's a wide range of stuff. How much of that success was the result of your own planning, or did happenstance or relationships redirect your career path each time? Look, I think uh, dumb luck 
is greatly underestimated in life. <laughs> I'll give you one example. I was working at 39 South LaSalle in a market research firm called Market Facts, and I decided to get an MBA degree. And I had planned to go to Northwestern where I'd done my undergraduate. But one day I'm walking down LaSalle Street and I see 19 South LaSalle, University of Chicago, downtown graduate school. And I said, well, why not? So that's the only reason I went to the University of Chicago. Fast forward 10, 20 years later, I'm running a company called Bell and Howe and I get a call from an old Chicago professor of mine named George Schultz, who later became Secretary of State and Treasury. And he said, Pete, the president wants to see you tomorrow. So the only reason I got offered that job is I lived on LaSalle, worked on LaSalle Street <laughs> near 19 South LaSalle. Now you can call that planning, I just call it dumb luck. And George, what about you? Uh, your career has really been all over the place. After you left the Senate, where you'd been majority leader, you took a, a leading role in negotiations for peace in Northern Ireland, the Middle East, even looked into the use of performance enhancing drugs in baseball. You've been a businessman, chancellor of Queen's University in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Did uh, the skills you acquired in each of those jobs lead you to or help you win the next job that you got? Uh, no, I think, uh, similar to Pete, most of what I've done has been accidental. Uh, uh, I didn't happen to look for any of these positions. They were offered to me. I, I, my story actually is somewhat similar to Ed's. I grew up in a very small town in Maine, and I had three older brothers who were very famous athletes. I came along, and I was not as good as my brothers. In fact, I was not as good as anybody else's brother. <laughs> and so at a very early age, I became known around our small town as Johnny Mitchell's kid brother, the one who isn't any good. <laughs> as you might expect, I developed a massive inferiority complex and a highly competitive attitude. And so I spent many years trying to figure out how I could do something that would surpass my brothers. And the high point of my life is when I was elected to the United States Senate to a full term. Uh, at the victory celebration, pictures were taken, and the next day, the front page of all the newspapers in Maine was a photograph of me standing at the microphone with my brother Johnny draped over me. And the caption said, Senator George Mitchell celebrating his upset election victory being cheered on by an unidentified supporter. <laughs> <laughs> That was the high point of my life. Okay. <coughs> so, each, so you all wound up doing stuff that you hadn't really expected. The real trick, of course, is to do well in it. Uh, you can get this next job, fail, and then that's the end of that. But uh, so, so in the end, do you just think that it was because, I'm throwing <coughs> this out to all of you, um, because you had what it took, although you weren't necessarily, you didn't necessarily know, know it until you found yourself in Congress, for example, or uh, working for an investment brokerage house? Anybody want to take that? I will. Yeah. <coughs> I uh, often lecture to uh, small groups of people, particularly students, and I say to them, the most important <coughs> information I can give to you, and listen carefully, I would say to them, is when you get your first <coughs> job, and the jobs thereafter. If you don't, after a reasonable time, don't <coughs> like doing it, get out of it. Most people don't get out of it. Most people are stuck in their entire mm -hmm. life span doing something that they really don't want to do, and it's being done for two thirds of the day that they spend uh, on it. And so one of the guiding principles for my life has always been, I will only do what gives me pleasure, not in the sense of uh, pleasure uh, as we know it, but I, uh, that I, that I. <laughs> not that, that kind of pleasure. That, no, <laughs> that I enjoy it. When someone says to me. Wait, Pete, do you need a cough drop? Should somebody bring you a cough drop? I have one just now. Oh. Okay, <laughs> okay. 
Please, I'll oh, just finish, finish up. When someone says to me, uh, Koch, you're a workaholic, because I have worked all my life. Uh, I've been in grocery stores, shoe salesmen, whatever it is, I worked. <laughs> and I enjoyed it. And I decided on each occasion, if it was, for example, a shoe salesman, when I got the job, I'd never had one before like that, I said, I'm going to be the best shoe salesman that Oppenheim and Collins ever had. And I was. <laughs> we're, in the, we're in the best mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. Well, certain personality traits like being outgoing help people throughout their lives. Uh, do you, George, do you think that you're, you have an outgoing personality? Do you do you, what is it about your personality that, that helped you and that you, you see is still helping you? Yeah. Uh, honestly, Leonard, I, I find internal questions like that awkward, and I prefer to leave that to others. I, my view is if you want to succeed, in politics or anything else in life, you gotta be what you are. Not pretend to be what you're not. And let others judge whether that's, what type of personality it is, whether it's acceptable. Being yourself is, I think, the most important aspect in, in getting ahead anywhere in life. And as Ed says, enjoy, enjoy what you're doing. The other thing I would say is uh, be willing to take risks. Uh, I was a federal judge in Maine a lifetime appointment, a great job, uh, sort of the pinnacle of most lawyers' dreams. And uh, a vacancy occurred in the U.S. Senate. Uh, the governor offered to appoint me. It was a very high risk. Uh, it was interim senators very rarely get elected to a full term. Uh, I took the chance, uh, and I've taken many other chances in life. I think you, you, you got to be willing to take risks in life uh, and reach for things that you might not ever have dreamed you're capable of doing. Well, do you think um, that being recognized has helped? Uh, the fact that you're a well-known public figure with many admirers. Uh, when, when you walk into a room, uh, Mickey, in, uh, in, on Wall Street, everybody knows who you are. Uh, that, that gives you instant recognition, doesn't it? Gives you recognition. But it also gives you, if you've made a mistake, they know that too. <laughs> well, Paul, you're the tallest man in the room usually. That's right. So you're easily spotted. Uh, and I want you to know, against all these other people, that I was the best athlete in my family. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> What'd you play? Basketball? Yeah, somehow nobody else was six feet, seven inches <laughs> tall and played basketball. Okay. I interrupted you. Well, well, I was asking about, does it help? at a certain point in your life that you're recognized and people admire you, it, doesn't it make things a little easier? Yeah, because I'm basically a very shy person and have, if they recognize you, it makes you feel good. Uh -huh. What about you, Pete? Uh, you're very well known in your field. Well, this is unintended effects, which is part of what we're talking about here. When I went on Wall Street, uh, I didn't know what a subordinated debenture was, and I probably still don't know. But having been a corporate CEO and a cabinet officer, I met virtually every major CEO in the country. And that was extremely useful in helping build the firm that we started, because you could talk to the CEOs on a kind of an equivalent basis. Now again, I certainly didn't go into public service thinking I'd be a good salesman, but it turns out to be uh, an accidental advantage. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure Paul has had the same experience as has uh, the senator. In your case, Ed, I read once that uh, you once uh, were very pleased when you realized that you'd been in the New York Times every day for the past year. Uh, there was a day when I was not. They weren't? What was that? <laughs> that was, well, that was Yom Kippur. That was uh, I'll, I'll <laughs> tell you, fasting. I, I, I enjoy uh, the fact that people come over and say hello and say nice things about my having uh, been mayor. But the nicest thing that's happened to me recently in that uh, regard was I was in the hospital recently. I'm OK, I'm uh, fully recovered. But when I was there at uh, New York Presbyterian, and it's a Dominican neighborhood, in, uh, so many of the patients are Dominican, and I was in the patient room. And this woman came over to me. She must have been about 75 or so, very young. <laughs> uh, 
And uh, <laughs> she uh, said to me, Mayor Koch, I like you. And that made me feel tremendous. <laughs> Dr. Marin, you've uh, talked about how important resilience is uh, because it promotes better coping with life. Uh, is that something you think that can be learned? Um, and how yes important and is no. resilience? You're, you're a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is that an, an issue with patients that, you, uh, that you're treating? You know, do you think what's the resilience level here? Definitely, and I'm listening to the panel. I, I know the sheer dumb luck story, you know, and I suspect more than one of you would probably say that's played a role in your life. But another way of looking at it is that when faced with a stressor of some kind, you kind of rise to the occasion and you problem solve. And part of resilience is being able to do that. So when I see my patients, for example, I look for, and, I'm, and the mean age of my patients is about 84 years. You know, and I have somebody who's 90, two folks who are 97 who come to see me for psychotherapy. So very insightful, very interesting people. What I look for, and I would be curious what the panel would say to this, is that in the face of the vicissitudes of life, be it when you were younger, be it now that you're older, how do you handle the stress? And a resilient person uses different things. For example, they use just marching on. They use humor. They use creativity and they bounce back from the situation. And that, just as a light motive, I'm wondering is, I'm as I'm listening to the panel, I have learned very little about you so far, but what I know, that would be something I would bet yeah. is a core feature. So let's ask everybody, how do you deal with the stressors in your life? Do you even think about the stresses? Do you meditate or do you just, uh, uh, well, or do you think it's just something that you can just plow right through, George? Uh, I'll answer two questions at once, uh, comment on the recognition, which is nice, it's flattering. People like recognition, but it's also dangerous because you start to believe things that people say to you and about you. So I, uh, I have found, not that I recommend this to anybody, I have found that the best way to deal with that issue and with stress is I had children late in life. So I have two teenage children and believe me, they are not impressed by my recognition. <laughs> and whenever I'm facing a difficult issue, like when I was in Northern Ireland or I was in the Middle East, I would think, oh my God, I gotta go back home and settle who's going out with whom and who's seeing whom and so forth. That relieved the stress of the real decisions. <laughs> but I knew that the most important things in life were those waiting for me at home. So. BB is easier to deal with than your kids. I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. What about you, Pete? Well, I had a magnificent example in my parents of dealing with something a lot more serious than the kind of stress most of us talk about. Uh, they were Greek immigrants who came over at the age of 17 without a hardly a penny in their pockets, third grade education, couldn't speak a word of English. And they migrate to the middle of the country in Nebraska where my father's brother was. And my father takes a job on the Union Pacific Railroad that no one else was willing to take, which is washing dishes on the middle of a steaming caboose. And he ate there and he slept there and he saved almost everything. And he started the inevitable Greek restaurant or diner not known for its cuisine, I can assure you. <laughs> but the fact that he worked there, the restaurant was open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, for 25 years without ever closing. And once he wanted to shorten the hours, and they had to get a key made because the door had never been locked in this restaurant. Now, I used to think of him coming home during the Depression and worrying and worrying about where the next dime was going to come from and so forth. So when I fight, start feeling stress, I start thinking about, I call this stress, what, the, the, what they had was first class stress and what I had was a very minor version. Mickey, uh, obviously starting your own company at a time when you were the only woman with a seat in uh, the New York Stock Exchange must have been stressful, but do you think that the stress of that time it was worse or, or less of a problem than the stresses you deal with now? 
They were totally different at that time. How much of your stresses today are age-related, and how many of them are just simply the changing world, uh, financial I world? have no age-related stress uh, that I know about. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. And I think that when I look at today's problems that some of the people have, in some ways, I was very lucky. When you did well, you were recognized, and you could take those steps. And yet today, some of the uh, best jobs in the world are now going to women. It has changed. We've matured in the country. And we have decisions to make. Uh, when I thought about the first question you asked me about you were known when you walked into a room, I got the job as superintendent of banks because of that. I happened to be a bleeding heart Republican and Governor Kerry called me and he said, I have made a commitment to hire women. I want a woman as superintendent you of couldn't banks. You could find a woman who was a Democrat? <laughs> well, I don't know if he tried or not. And he said, uh, I'd like you as superintendent of banks. And so uh, I had to put everything in a blind trust. I couldn't walk into my firm. I couldn't talk to anyone. And I became, as I called it, the first woman SOB. <laughs> <laughs> now, Ed, in your, in your case, you had a, a heart attack. Was it a heart attack or a stroke when you were mayor? I had a, a stroke in uh, 1986. I had a heart attack in uh, 1999. In 2009, I had a quadruple bypass. But do you see this, the stroke and the, and the heart attack as stress-related? Because uh, you've been in stressful jobs. So. But let me, let me say this. To be the mayor of the city of New York, greatest job in America, in my judgment, and a unique job being mayor of any town is unique and very special. And uh, when the problems started to, to arise, and they did very quickly, strikes and things of that kind, no money, I mean, uh, horrendous problems uh, at the time, um, I said to myself, I could collapse under all the weight of all these problems, and I'm not the smartest guy in the world, and there are better people who could be mayor uh, in terms of qualifications than me, but they chose not to run, and of those who ran, the people thought I was the best. So I'm just gonna give it my best, and I'm gonna go to sleep at night. Because if you don't go to sleep at night and uh, wake up refreshed, you can't do the job. And so I will tell you uh, that I had only two or three sleepless nights in the course of 12 years. So I, that's true, and I had a lot of issues. But I decided I'm not going to be able to do the best if I look at it, oh my, I'm overwhelmed. I'm going to look the best and be the best if I give it my best with all of my strength. And the key uh, in being mayor or any great uh, position of uh, leadership is you have to exude confidence. You have to say to uh, people, trust me and I will lead you across the desert. <laughs> well, that's what I said to them. <laughs> Moisha Katz, we didn't know. <laughs> Did you pot the waters on the way? <laughs> <laughs> now, do, do you, uh, Paul, do you uh, ever think about the stress that you'd have to face if you were still Chairman of the Fed? The worst stress I had was when this young superintendent of banking in New York, a female, came around <laughs> to tell me how to do my job in the Federal Reserve. <laughs> uh, I mean, do, you, do, you, uh, do you envy Ben Bernanke right now? Well, he's got the excitement of doing something. He's the guy that can act and move. His stress time was two or three years ago when he was really breaking new ground, and that was, you know, he felt he was Hans Brinker with his finger in the dike. He was. And, uh, but I'm sure he felt like, hey, you know, I'm there, I got in charge, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna, 
express some confidence and people better believe me, they haven't got any choice. Right. <laughs> well, one thing I can say to what you're all saying is that one thing that's been associated with successful aging is being conscientious. But what? Being, being conscientious. conscientious. Being want to uh, be able to provide something to society to stay relevant, if you will, to feel that you're having self-efficacy. So what I'm hearing here is that stress is, eh, you get over it, you keep on moving. But it's these other characteristics that I'm hearing that probably are very important to this group of people. Experts say that, uh, inc including Dr. Marin, that among the most important ingredients that, of, for successful aging are financial security, humor, human relationships, rewarding work, and volunteerism. And, Spiritual life, well, we know that you all have senses of humor. Uh, just based on what you said, you've all been successes financially. Uh, what about the other things, uh, uh, human relationships? Uh, some of you have, you're married to uh, the, uh, the, one of the creators of, of uh, you, you are, of, of uh, Sesame Street, right? Uh, so does um, knowing Elmo uh, keep you <laughs> filling out? No, actually, I was the model for Oscar the Grouch. <laughs> but anyway, do you, do, you, do you see all of those things as playing an important role in your lives? I, I think they do in every life. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's limited to us or to any age group. It really is the essence of life. You're born into a family, and uh, I... I fortunate to come from a large and loving family, lots of kids, lots of cousins, lots of grandkids. It helps in elections, too, to have a lot of relatives uh, <laughs> uh, uh, who are well known, but uh, I, I, I think that's, that's not limited to any age group or any society. Uh, human relationships, particularly family relationships, are critical to any sense of well-being and security. Well, there's, uh as people are often forced to retire, they wind up getting involved in volunteer work. Um, it's my sense that that's something that you, you all felt you had a responsibility beyond what you were doing, so you got involved in other things all along. In your case, Pete, uh, you created your own foundation, in fact, to do good. So uh, is, does that come out of that same sensibility? When, when did you start doing that? Well, I was um, <clears throat> presumably educated at the University of Chicago. And uh, you were walking we, down we had a great professor there named George Stigler who won the Nobel Prize. And he used to say, if you have no alternative, you have no problem. And I thought about that at some length. And I've been boring people, as Paul knows, for at least 30 years about the demographic explosion and the entitlement programs and how totally unsustainable they are and how if we don't get at it, this country's future is threatened. So when I retired, I had a decision to make. And I remember reading something that Kurt Vonnegut and Joe Heller had talked about. And Kurt, when Joe were out in the Hamptons at a fancy billionaire hedge fund. I guess that's a redundancy. Uh, <laughs> out on the beach. And Vonnegut says to Heller, Joe, doesn't it bother you that this guy makes more money in a day than you've made selling Catch-22 since its inception? And Heller says, no, I got something this guy doesn't have. So obviously, Vonnegut says, what in hell could you have this guy doesn't have? And Heller says, I know the meaning of enough. And that was one of those stories that really had an impact on me. I had enough, so why didn't I give my money to something I had passion for that would help this American dream be there for other people as well as me? You're nodding your head, Mickey, I guess. Do, yeah. Did you, you ever have enough? Uh, I felt that way, yes. I spend a lot of my creative time today on a school program I started. When I was superintendent of banks, my deputy brought in these youngsters of 17 and 18 that were going bankrupt. And I talked to them and I said, 
how did this happen? What did your parents think? And they would say, my parents have the same problems. It's credit cards. And at that time, I said, if I'm ever in a position, I will change this. And I started a program that I give to the schools that teaches the youngsters credit cards and checking accounts and what are the deductions from your paycheck. And from something like that, you can create ideas that you know and things that will help other people. And I was raised with when good things happen, you owe. And I can say that I got an award from the state of New Jersey, and they're teaching it in some of their schools. I'm frustrated as all hell because I have three people that I pay to just offer the program to the schools, and the teachers want to be paid more to study it and teach it. And it, sort of, it bothers me because I feel that when you're giving them a tool like that that can change people's lives. But I've learned to accept that not everything goes the way that we like it to go. George? I, I, I agree with what uh, Mira said, particularly on the sense of obligation. Uh, my family background is similar to Pete's. My mother was an immigrant. My father, the orphan son of immigrants. Neither of them had any education. My mother couldn't read or write. Uh, and I believe totally in the American dream because I've lived it. They, they spent their lives making sure their kids got the education they didn't have. And all of their children got college degrees and several further graduate degrees. So I think that not just us here on the stage, not just people in this room, but everybody in this country is very lucky. We really are the most fortunate people ever to have lived. We live in what, despite its many imperfections, is the most open, the most just, the most free society in all of human history. And I think it is a shared responsibility and a shared result. This is a 310 million person community. And so, I think, having been so lucky, that I have an obligation to do what I can to help others get the same chance that I had. And I'm sure everybody here feels that, and that, I think, is critical to the future of our society. That, that sense of sharing, that sense of community, that sense of nationhood. In her presentation before we uh, started talking, Dr. Marin talked about the importance of exercise. Do you all exercise? You have. Uh, <laughs> Do you do anything special to promote mm -hmm. your acuity of, of thinking? I had a trainer at 6 o'clock this morning. <laughs> and Ed, Ed, despite the, uh, the, the strokes and the heart attacks, well, I understand uh, you, you go I, to the I gym First, I have to confess, I have not, uh, for uh, several years, exercised, which I used to do because I had uh, spinal uh, stenosis. And when I went into... Uh, the hospital in 2009, uh, uh, for another matter, uh, I had to lie in bed uh, for six weeks mm. and it cured my spinal stenosis. <laughs> so I, I've had no pain since. I told this, by the way, uh, President Obama, uh, when uh, I met with him uh, not so long ago, uh, he, we, he said to me, you look terrific. And I know you exercise every day. They had briefed him. So I said, well, it's not true anymore. I haven't <laughs> uh, for a couple of years now because of the spinal stenosis. And I was lying in bed, said I. And while I lying lying in bed, I was holding the picture of John Cardinal O'Connor, a good friend of mine, uh, now <laughs> deceased. And so if they ever want to make him a saint, I'm his miracle. <laughs> <laughs> now, Paul. So, so. The um, president's um, chief of staff, um, uh, Bill, the mayor from Chicago was... Bill Daly. Bill, da Bill Daly, wonderful guy, chief of staff at the uh, time. Uh, he said to me, could I borrow the picture? <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> now, Paul... But I'm going if, back to exercise next week. If the president invited you 
into one of his pickup games, would you uh, consider playing basketball again? I'd be the coach. <laughs> uh, yeah. my, my role model was Robert Maynard Hudson, president of the University of Chicago at the age of 29. He said whenever he had the slightest urge to exercise, he laid down on the couch and napped until the feeling <laughs> 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 Our audience uh, has joined in this discussion, uh, not just the audience here, but also some people who are watching this all over the country. And here's a question from Sedona, Arizona. In line with the new movie Hope Springs with Meryl Streep, what are your ideas and thoughts about the expansion of our intimate and sexual lives <laughs> in the octogenarian years and beyond? <laughs> well, last I heard Meryl Muriel. Streep is not 80 years old. <laughs> Well, I reviewed the movie. Yeah. I, I do movie reviews. <laughs> and uh, Meryl Streep is really such a wonderful actress. It was a terrible movie, but she elevated it. <laughs> and uh, I got a, a letter uh, from one of the recipients of my review saying, how dare you give that a good review? <laughs> and I said, and, she, uh, uh, and you said in your review that you did it because the acting was so fine. That's no reason. It was a terrible movie. And so I said, you're right, and I was too kind, and you're too harsh. <laughs> Anybody else want to tackle sex? Uh, <laughs> we're going to leave that one for the movie. OK, well, this is a question from Hilton Head, South Carolina. Um, this person asks, have you been able to keep up with rapid changing technology? How do you feel about your relationship with current technology? Uh, it's been pointed out more uh, way too many times that, uh, that uh, our kids know so much more about technology than we do. Uh, That's what took the banks in trouble. They know too much about technology. <laughs> yeah, well, There's nothing you, about banking. Do, I, I, <laughs> uh, can you, do you uh, tweet? No. <laughs> Are you yeah, on Facebook? What it no. Is. Well, you don't tweeting. have to act that way. I mean, Good, okay. I'm 80 years old. I'm 85. Do you know how to, <laughs> you know how to down, what is it, download? Yeah, do you know how to download a, a film? No. no. What about you, Ed? I'm, uh, <coughs> I'm uh, computer illiterate. Uh, I was born too early. Uh, when I have a uh, problem, I call my uh, eight-year-old uh, grandnephew, and he tells me what to do. And you, Mickey? You have a staff to help you, I right? have a staff to help me. Yeah. Pete? I have finally found one device that I can't say I master it, but I can use it, which is a Kindle, mm -hmm. which anything beyond that is totally beyond my consideration. Yeah. <laughs> George, tell me you are George, computer uh, literate. Uh, you know, I live up in the summer on the coast of Maine. Someone said, uh, why don't you have a boat? I said, the only thing better than having a boat is having a lot of friends who have boats. <laughs> and uh, I've got three computer whizzes in my house, and they can handle any task I assign to them. That's a good way of problem solving. Yeah, they figure is, ways to it make is, it work. Right, right. Here's a question from Sands Point, New York. Should people retire or keep on working? Does work keep you young and active? Well, you're all active. You're all, none of you have retired. Uh, but you have retired, a few of you, from jobs, uh, did you just automatically, when, for example, Pete, when uh, you retired from a position, did you just simply think, well, I'm going to move on to something else? Well, I remembered what Stiegler taught me about if you have no alternative, you have no problem. So I thought about the alternative. And the alternative was what? To watch my golf game disintegrate every day? And uh, I belong to a club in which there are a lot of retired CEOs. And <clears throat> after sitting through some of their dinners, because they're down at this club, the height of the rhetoric in a typical dinner was how they did on the 16th hole <laughs> compared to the 17th hole. And I said to myself, that isn't for me. And I think if you think of the alternative, and, and you have an alternative that you have some passion about, as we've all discussed. That's a far better alternative. Have um, you retired, Paul? Well, not really. I don't know what definition of retirement well, what is. What do you do? I, I mean, go well, to the office, do good, of course. Mm -hmm. 
try to keep busy, and you continue. I don't know what I'd do without it. That's a, and Ed, you, you continue to maintain an office in a law firm and you well, do all those other that, things. Well, more than that, I'm not even on Medicare because uh, I have private insurance uh, and I'm still working and you can't be on Medicare yeah. if you're still working. Did you know that? Yes. No, oh, I'm on Medicare. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on a voucher system. I'm living in the future. Yeah, I don't have uh, Medicare taken away from me. Yeah. <laughs> No, I'm a Democrat. We're not going to take it away. <laughs> Nikki, you, you haven't retired. No, I haven't retired. I have my firm. I'm in the office every day, but I spend a lot of time on the school program because I realize I could change people's lives. And George? I think one must be careful not to overgeneralize on this. It is individual, it depends upon circumstances. Nobody up here has spent their entire lives at hard manual labor. That's Both true. of my parents did and retirement in their 60s was appropriate for them. So I don't think we should preach to everybody about we do, everybody must determine his or her own circumstances. It, in my circumstance, uh, I think it is far healthier to continue working, to be active, uh, uh, both mentally and physically, I think that does produce longevity, uh, and I think it produces a higher quality of life. But as I said, there are many people who have individual circumstances that warrant a different course, and they ought to be free to pursue that without fear of being stigmatized in any way. This is from our audience, and it's, a, it's kind of a follow-up to what we've been talking about. This person wrote, each of you has continued to evolve and take on new responsibilities. What do you look forward to accomplishing in the coming years? Do you, do you have a goal? Mm. Or is it just you'll take it as it comes? Paul? Well, I got a goal. I, uh, you know, just talk about whether you need money or not. I got enough in a personal sense. But I got a goal that might require some of Pete Peterson's money. Mm. <laughs> 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 That's a low blow. <laughs> No, I do well, have... You can talk after the... Well, uh, after after we will. Sure no, but I got plans for setting up uh, my little dream and set up a little institute to make the government work better. And that's the challenge for you. Well, it would be nice if we had the Volcker <laughs> rule in effect, <laughs> wouldn't it? <laughs> do you uh, ever wonder about that and why it remains controversial? It seems like a reasonable rule. Yeah, it is perfectly reasonable, but there are people out there that, you know, profit from it or profit from continuing to have the proprietary trading. So, you know, it's out there in the midst of the political fight and technological fight, but it's a good rule. I want you to remember that <laughs> okay. this evening. That's the one lesson take away. It's a good rule. Ed? Well, I, I'm not uh, materialistic uh, so long as I have as much money as I need to buy whatever I want. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but it depends on what you want, Ed, doesn't it? <laughs> but the, the fact uh, is uh, that I, I'm lucky. I mean, the, the, the heart of the matter is that in your old age, in your retirement, semi-retirement, not to have to worry about paying bills. And I don't. And the reason is very simple. Uh, it, it, it came with my first book. I made a lot of money with my first book. Yeah. And I put it uh, all in the stock market, and I've never gotten out of the stock market, and I've done very well. And uh, I will never want in, in those uh, terms. So for me, I wrote a book as to what it is that I want out of the balance of my life, and that is to remain relevant. I, I want to have an impact on the activities of the day, and I think I do. And of all the things I do, the one that gives me the most pleasure is writing. And I put out, as I told you earlier, a commentary every week, and I write it. There are very few people in public life who write their own stuff. I do, and I enjoy it. And uh, I, I can get as many as 500 replies, and I read every one of them to a single commentary and answer every one of them, the answers are very short. Bill Buckley taught me, and I, I loved Bill Buckley, we were very good friends, and he taught me uh, how to write 
short responses. It's very hard. You have to train yourself <laughs> to write a short response. Uh, but once you uh, have the training, then it zips by. So I'm enjoying my life more than I ever have. Nikki, what do you... My God. What do you look forward to accomplishing in the coming years? That's a very interesting question. Uh, <coughs> I want to stay busy doing the things I want to do where I see a challenge. You know, I've changed my life considerably a couple of times and did it my way, and I did it nicely, and I was successful as superintendent of banks. I saved the savings banks of the state of New York. I had a third of them going broke because, and I got them to pass a law in Washington and also in New York. And I saw, I had the feeling of doing something that affected people. And that was a great feeling. I have a great feeling when I go into a classroom and they're teaching my school program and I say these people are not going to go bankrupt at 20 years old. And that can go on for a long time. Uh, I'm sure that I'll find another challenge similar to that one of these days. It just happens if you have an active mind it happens, and I'll be lucky enough so it will happen. But at the moment, I'm trying, I would love to make this school program national. That would be my goal now, so that everybody going, getting out of school, it's a disgrace when you see these children go broke. And that's my goal, is to make it national. Then I'll look for the next one. And Pete, uh, I'm assuming that your goal is to get people to finally listen to what you're saying when you, you uh, talk about public policy? Well, first I'd like to say to Ed, um, a lot of us are book writers, but we don't enjoy the returns that he does. <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, when I was the Blackstone Group, we used to let the young uh, interns take a shot at the senior partners at Christmas. And you remember the old game called Karnak, mm -hmm. in which here are the answers, what are the questions? And one year after one of my books, the answers were 100,000, 99,999, one, and zero. What are the questions? One, how many books did Peterson print? <laughs> Secondly, how many did he sign and give away? <laughs> Third, how many were bought? And finally, how many were read? So, <laughs> wow. so we, have a, we have an objective that goes like this. This country on the fiscal front, as Paul knows better than anybody and you know, Senator, is facing both a historic opportunity and a major, major challenge, which is to what to do about this so-called fiscal cliff. And if we try to approach that problem the way we approach the debt limit problem and the super committee, and the Congress and the president are all out to kill each other, and they're polarized and paralyzed and so forth, we're risking the future of this country. So we are working as hard as anybody could to try to come up with some reasonable answers to those questions. Uh, there was an article in the Times <laughs> about how uh, many people are just trying to survive on Social Security alone. Uh, George, if you were in, in the, back in the Senate, uh, do you think that you could have much of an impact on, on changing the way things are going in Washington today? Uh, I'm sorry, do I think who could have an impact? Do you think you, think you could? Yeah, I could, oh. oh. It's, it's a different kind of Senate today, isn't it? Or Congress, anyway. It's, it's very different. Uh, when I was elected Senate Majority Leader, the first person I went to see was Bob Dole, who was the Republican leader in the Senate. And I said to him, these are very difficult jobs. 
in the best of circumstances and they're impossible in the worst of circumstances. So I said, I, I want to tell you how I intend to treat you and I hope you'll respond in kind. And I said very simple things. I'll never surprise you. I'll never try to embarrass you. I'll never criticize you personally. And he enthusiastically responded. And uh, for six years, uh, we ran the Senate. I as majority leader, he as minority leader. Uh, we disagreed on almost every bill. We negotiated hundreds of uh, agreements. Uh, but to this moment, not a single harsh word has ever passed between us, publicly or privately. It can be done. Uh, it was done. Now, one person can't change a culture. One person can set an example that hopefully will lead others collectively to change a culture. So I think it is a very difficult circumstance, but uh, uh, I think, frankly, uh, it's not going to get better in the short term and it's likely to get worse until the American people decide they've had enough of it. Ultimately, ultimately, the Congress is representative of the public. And the fact of the matter is, we don't like to talk about this because it's easy to criticize the Congress. The public is divided. This country's split just about down the middle. And everybody wants agreement, but they want it on their terms. Uh, and uh, the, the political leaders tend to represent their constituencies. I, I don't think it has to be like it is. It's always been rough. It's bad now. I think it's going to get worse until the American people decide for a change. Could I say one thing about, though you didn't, you didn't let me answer about goals for the future. So let's start this round this way and go that way. Let me respond to that. Please. Uh, I have two goals. Uh, they're both education related and uh, uh, one is personal. I got to keep working until I get my kids through college. He's going to pay their tuition. <laughs> and they're very young. The second is broader. When I left the Senate, I started a foundation to create scholarships for needy youngsters in my state of Maine to go on to college. I had many helping hands in my life, and I wanted to extend a helping hand to others. And uh, we've been very successful. We've given millions of dollars to thousands of students. But the demand is greater. And we all know today in America, Education, further education beyond high school is essential to success. You just look at the unemployment figures. The unemployment levels uh, decline as education levels increase, as does income and everything else in life. Uh, and so my goal, which I know will not be attainable in my lifetime, but I figure if you aim high, you'll get further down the road, is to see to it that uh, no child in Maine who has the talent and willingness to work but lacks the financial resources, will be denied education beyond high school. None. In the, in the, remaining, in the remaining time, um, I would ask each of you to share your wisdom and insights on your chosen field. And uh, we're fast running out of time, so <laughs> can we try to make it as, as brief as possible? Uh, Pete, do you believe that your foundation and other not-for-profit foundations will succeed in helping resolve the contentious dialogue and enable America to pursue a fiscally sustainable path for the future? Well, we haven't talked much about aging management. You know, we talk a lot in life about anger management, but not much about aging management. And if you think of aging and, and uh, so forth, you've got to ask yourself to, again, focus on uh, what is the alternative? If you believe this problem is as serious as I believe it is, is the alternative to sit on the, my rocking chair at age 110, I hope, and say, uh, well, it's too difficult a problem. They're intractable, they're polarized, they dislike each other and so forth, and nothing can be done. Or do you give it a shot? And to me, the, the thought of waking up on my deathbed, having known this problem was serious and doing nothing, is a totally unacceptable alternative. So I find it easy <laughs> to try. Ed, um, how do you see New York City faring over the next five years? Well, you know that uh, we're gonna have a new mayor. next year uh, we're going to have the mayoralty. And, uh, what bothers me, and I worry about it all the time, is whether or not 
whoever is selected uh, from the five or six who have been identified as candidates will have the courage and the intelligence and the willingness to stand up to the municipal unions uh, which brought the city, in my judgment, in great part their responsibility to the edge of bankruptcy. And uh, almost every mayor before me caved to uh, those forces because it was easy, because a municipal union leader could say, there are uh, 300,000 of us, as is the case today, and there are four in our family. It means over a million votes, Mr. Mayor. Will the next mayor have the courage, the cojones, to stand up to the pressures that that represents? Mickey, there are, there are around a dozen CEOs of Fortune 500 companies who are women. That's 12 out of 500. Uh, what's necessary to improve that? It's improving every day. It's yeah, I heard it was 13 I, today. It may be 14 tomorrow. But seriously speaking, I go into the institutions today and they have women taking in positions where there were never women before. And these women are determined and they're ambitious and they take pride in what they're doing. And I think the companies are getting a little smarter. And I try to encourage them. I speak to a lot of women groups. <laughs> And I see an enthusiasm in these younger people. And I'm sorry to say I see a partisan hatred in this country today. And it bothers me. It really, truly <coughs> bothers me. Because I can't understand it, but there's a hatred. I feel it when they speak. And I feel that this country is, I want this country to be in a position so it can turn out more Pete Petersons or Ed Koch's or Mickey Sieberts or my good friend Paul, because there's such an opportunity here. And when I look at this partisan hatred, I, I've asked myself many times, could you do anything about it, Mickey, personally? And I say, no. Op-ed articles aren't going to do it. Paul, I, I read in a profile of you that you don't buy the conventional wisdom that financial innovation is necessary for a healthy economy and that the only useful banking innovation was the invention of the ATM. <laughs> so, so how do we clean up this mess? <laughs> well. It's a mess. I think we've all been talking one way or another about things that are quite unhappy in our society and in our economy. And we've got a big mess in the financial system that reflects, uh, you know, a, a period of excesses, lack of discipline. What makes it so complicated is not just the United States, it's most of the world. Look at, it, look at Europe, which has more division, more difficulty than we do. Look at Japan, which has had 10 years of very little growth and now even less. Or any place else you want to look, even China isn't doing quite so well now. So we've got an enormous challenge here to straighten out the financial system and to live through, uh, you use the technical word, deleveraging, we have too much debt, how do we work off the excessive debt in the economy and in other economies so that we can grow again with some vigor. And part of it is, the important part of it is the budgetary stuff that that Pete and others are rightly worried about and been devoting enormous effort to bring the message home to the American people. And what bothers me, uh, Mickey's bothered about hatred and it's there. What bothers me is the lack of trust in our government these days. Uh, any, any governments, local level, state level, and particularly the federal level, you cannot build a strong democracy when the population doesn't trust the people running the government. Well, know what they're doing, and I, and I'm afraid that problem has gotten worse and worse, aggravated by the economic situation, but not 
even primarily due to the economic situation. You see these great divisions in opinion. Uh, people who think government can't do anything right, and a lot of things they don't do right, and we ought to change that, but the fact that we're going to live here without an effective government that can be supported and admired when push comes to shove by the American people is a pretty deep-seated problem that we ought to worry about. George, um, peace in the Middle East is starting to look almost unattainable. Are you at all optimistic about the prospects of a real peace there? Well, of course, the Middle East covers a lot of countries. Well, now we have Egypt and Libya also. Uh, and, and, and a lot of people. Uh, I think that the foreseeable future will be one of turbulence and uh, uncertainty. History is very clear that uh, frequently bad governments that are removed by revolution are followed by governments that are worse. The best, most obvious example, of course, is Russia, where they were oppressed by the Tsars for centuries and then replaced by the murderous regime of Stalin. Not many people would think that was a big improvement. Uh, history also tells us that revolutions often take a long time to play out. Uh, in our own country, in a much simpler, less complex time, eight years passed from the end of fighting in the American Revolution to the establishment of the United States. So we should not expect these revolutions which are bringing to people who have not recently held, or in many cases never held, the right of self-governance, the right of individual freedom, which we so much value, which we so much take for granted. Uh, there will be revolutions, counter-revolutions. I think there will be turbulence for some time to come. Uh, and it will be a test of us as well. Do we really believe in the right of self-governance, even when self-governance may produce policies with which we disagree? Uh, uh, I think we can and should be helpful and supportive. I think that there will be, in some cases, democratic institutions taking root. In other cases, there will not be. I think one mistake we've made uh, is to overemphasize the importance of elections. We have created the impression that if you hold an election, you're a democracy. If you hold an election, you've completed an important first step toward democracy, but there's a lot more to come. It means institutions, it means the rule of law, it means having a second and a third and a fourth election, it means transferring power peacefully, and most importantly of all, it means seeing that freedom is available to everyone, which means crucially protection of the rights of minorities for those who do not conform to a national ideal or standard. I think that's a way off. I think it's an opportunity that we can lead in, but for the immediate future, you said the next few years, I think there will be uncertainty, upheaval, uh, and uh, some degree of conflict with mixed results. Well, I hate to end this on such a happy <laughs> note, but yeah. we've run out of time. Yeah. My, uh, my great thanks to all of you for coming here, and George Mitchell, Pete Peterson, Real Siebert, Ed Koch, Paul Volcker, Dr. Deborah Marin, Dan Kaplan. It's been great. We're finished. Thank you so much.